Hello, everybody. Welcome to our webinar. I look slightly confused, but you guys can't even see me. Um, let's put me on screen. Uh, you, I'm looking slightly confused because I was just double checking how many people we've actually got signed up because it's been going crazy today. We're on 265 people. So welcome to all 265 of you when you watch this, whether you're the marvellous people who've come on to watch us live or whether you're some of those people who are going to be catching us when we, uh, when we release the replay. So if you're watching live, please do share that replay with your teams, because I know there's going to be loads you're going to get from this. You're going to want to share with all of them, too. So what are we talking about today? Well, we are going to be talking about what's actually going to move the needle in 2024. I know you're all drowning in predictions for 2024 at the moment. Um, there are some absolutely brilliant ones coming in, um, but I think you've picked the best one to come along here. I've just been chatting with our panellists and wow, is it going to be a good session? So this is one of our e-commerce explored webinars. We run one about every month where we tackle a different topic. Obviously, January had to be this, but I'll tell you at the end a bit about what we're doing next month, which is a bit more of a unusual topic in the space, but one I think you're going to like. It's the first co-production between two the two new sides of my business. We've got the podcast world, so e-commerce master plan and keep optimizing, and then e-commerce tech, which is the newest member of my media family. And we bring the two together in these e-commerce explored events. Before I tell you who our panelists are, um, I should also say a huge thank you to the sponsors of this session, Penny Black and Sweet Analytics. You'll find details of them somewhere under this video as you're watching it, but it's great to have them involved as well. Uh, we've got some hellos coming in. Oh, one of our panelists has already found the chat functionality. It could be dangerous. Uh, and also, uh, Edward is here again. Edward, I think, I think if we had a loyalty card, you've got one for every single single session we've done. Um, so uh, loyalty cards to Edward. Thank you for being here. Right. A uh, couple of things to tell you on a housekeeping front. Number one, I am currently suffering with COVID, which as you can tell, isn't too bad an incident of COVID. However, I am, I am prone to doing things on the wrong screen, which I was doing just then. So if you're wondering why is nothing moving and Chloe says things are moving, that's probably what it is. You're also going to put this slight bunged upness. So if anything goes wrong today, we are blaming it on my COVID. Um, <laughs> great to hear from the rest of you saying you're, you're here and tuning in. The other key thing is that chat functionality, which is on that side of your screen, is not just for saying hello crazy. I know it's not just for saying hello, although we do love that. It's also for sending your questions in. So if you've got a burning question for one of our panelists or you, there's something we talk about you want to know more about, please fire it into the chat and let us know. And I will do my best to bring it into the screen and get people um, answering it for you. The one caveat for that is we're only here for an hour. And I've used three minutes of that hour telling you about my cold. So um, ask your questions early if you want to make sure they get um, answered. Obviously, if a question occurs to you in the last 15 minutes, go on, give it to us. But if you're sitting there right now going, I really want to ask this, ask it now. And I will do my and then I've got a really good chance of actually getting it answered for you. So um, let, as we have COVID head on, let's see if we've actually remembered to tell you everything we're supposed to at this point. Check the script, check the script, check the script. Yes, <laughs> I've remembered it all, which means it's time for me to bring our four brilliant guests on. We're going to be joined by Jamie Huskisson from JH, Molly from Penny Black, Zoe from Turn Eco and Tim from Your Basket is Empty. A a massively wide ranging amount of experience in the e-commerce space. They all know so much, but they've also got such interesting areas of specialism. I have no idea where we're going to end up going with this session today, but I'm thoroughly looking forward to it. So let's get them all up on screen so they can tell you a bit more about themselves. Hello, everybody. Hello. 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 Brilliant to have you all here. Um, we're going to go clockwise from me. And I would love it if you could tell everybody watching a little bit about who you are and what you do and a little bit about your e-commerce expertise just to set the scene. So just one or two minutes would be brilliant. Zoe, as we've got a Zoe and a Chloe on this, Zoe, you can go first. <laughs> Thanks, Chloe. Uh, pleased to be here. So hi, everyone. I'm Zoe Roswell. Um, 
I am the co-founder of Turn Eco, but also another business. Um, I've worked in digital retail most of my working life. I spent a large chunk of my early career in the digital team at Topshop when it was uh, the best place in high school to work and to shop. Um, went on to try the luxury world as director of Omni and e-commerce at Jimmy Choo and then did a stint at uh, Urban Outfitters Euro, so the Urban Outfitters Euro as digital director. Um, that's a bit of a tough person, sorry. For the last four years, along with my partner Kate, um, I've actually had my own digital consultancy where we help brands and retailers with all things digital, um, whilst also running our other business, which is Turn Pico. And Turnico is a circular retail software service that enables brands and retailers circular models such as trading, resale, and directly in very cool. Now, someone has got background noise going on. Whoever that is, could they mute when they're not talking? <laughs> and um, Oh, it's gone. Molly, it might have been you. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but so now I'm going to ask you to unmute and tell us a bit about yourself oh, and what you're up to. Sorry. It's, it's the co-working space. People are popping in, seeing if there's a free meeting room. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Molly. I'm the marketing manager at Penny Black. Um, Penny Black allows brands to turn their unboxing moments into a new personalised marketing channel. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later into some of the questions. Uh, but my background is I've had I've got about seven to eight years experience in the kind of e-commerce technology space, specializing more so in the tech that helps you retain customers and build customer loyalty. Um, and having a marketing function there, I've got a lot of experience writing content for brands on how to build those through communities, through their email platforms, email marketing, all the different channels. So excited to be here and on this great panel. Brilliant to have you here, Molly. Thank you. Um, and uh, now we move into kind of like, plat I'm going to call you boys platform land for today, which may <laughs> be completely lads. wrong. You can be the platform, platform lads. lads. Yeah. yeah. I'm happy um, with that. Uh, Jamie, we'll, we'll come to you first. Tell us a bit what you guys get up to at JH. All right. So JH is a uh, forward thinking e-commerce agency for uh, growth oriented brands on Adobe Commerce and Magento Open Source. So what we help people do is get unstuck from the growth curve, the I've got no more ideas, where the heck do I get them from, into that next stage and right in front of more and more customers that they're, they're going to enjoy. Simple as that. Okay, cool. Tim and yourself. Uh, what's more What's more to say? I'm a platform lad. I think that's it. That's <laughs> um, uh, so my thing is called Your Basket is Empty. We are a content and consulting company on the consulting side. Uh, we work with agencies and tech partners, and we bring eight years of digital commerce experience to drive change within the business, right? How do we do that? We do that with advisory and fractional consulting services. And some of the things that we do, uh, recently I was involved in a Shopify go-to-market strategy with Big SI. Uh, we built a lot of partner programs, uh, done a lot of marketing and sales strategy, a lot of sales ops kind of stuff. Uh, and our model has a shelf life, like we're not going to work with clients forever. That's like a key thing. So once we're done, we kind of hire in a team to kind of help them like um, expand from there. And then on the content side, uh, the objective is to inform, inspire and entertain the modern commerce community. And we do that with a podcast, a newsletter, and we're involved in a lot of events like this. Before that, just to give you a bit more context, uh, I was at a Shopify agency here in the UK. We were both UK and, and, and the States um, called We Make Websites. I was the commercial director there. I was a shareholder. We sold to the Born Group in 2021, which allowed me to start The Basket is Empty. Very cool. So everybody, as I said, we have, all of you watching right now, we have a phenomenal range of experience in our panellists. I think we've we've got, apart from possibly B2B, but I'm sure someone's going to contradict me on this, we've got every angle covered. So do you get those questions in. Gethin, thank you so much for your question. We will use that one a little later on. But to get the ball rolling, I'm going to start us off with um, this little beauty for you, a little challenge for all of you. Complete the sentence. The advice you've been giving most often to merchants to help them be successful in 2024 is, what are you busy telling people at the moment? Um, Molly, given you're the deepest in a specific arena, I'm guessing you probably got your question ready to go on this one. So we'll start with you, but then we'll make sure we cover yeah. everybody else off as well. So what I like to say is that um, brands need to do more with what they're already doing. And what I mean by that is it's all about building the 
customer loyalty up. So you've already got those existing customers in, it's better to nurture them and build that over time rather than spending loads more on acquiring new customers and losing out on the margins there. But also, and kind of where, where I fit in, like you were hinting, Chloe, is try and turn something you're already doing into a better way to drive revenue. So Penny Black is all about turning your unboxing moments in your packaging into a marketing channel and optimizing that. So I think more brands could be using things like packaging and that they're already spending those investments in to actually drive repeat business and repeat purchases. And I think that's a massive untapped piece and something we're really pushing this year uh, and where we fit in really nicely because yeah, you're already spending, why not use it to, to retain those customers? Um, and it's working as well. So just pushing more people into thinking beyond these new interesting channels and just using what they're already they've already got at their disposal for that sustainable I growth. So agree with you there, Molly, because I think um I, well, as you 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 certainly know, I'm a massive fan of offline marketing. But also I think when we're in these interesting economic times, let's put it that way, it's a great time to go to, un to overturn all the stones in the business and go how can we make each of these elements work harder for us whether yeah. it's about um you know putting our marketing messages on blank pieces of paper or in other, in other opportunities but we should be looking at that through the whole business to see how can we squeeze more uh, or cost less out of these areas but we're going to hold that one there for now we're going to go let's go to zoe next what's your complete the sentence um that if you're not already you need to be thinking about circular retail because long term, it is your growth strategy. Um, circular retail drives customer acquisition, deeper customer relationships, and helps generate new revenue streams. And what kind of retailer doesn't want that? Yeah, it's a it's such a fascinating area and one um, one I'm super interested in. So I'm sure we'll talk about that a bit more later as well. So thank so thank you for adding this one. And yeah, I think 2024 definitely the year for for starting that journey, if not getting a lot further on on with it. Um, Jamie, let's come to you next. Right. So I, I always like starting the year by just just sitting down and saying this is going to be our slow moment. The rest of it's going to be full speed. Right. So sit down, list out the mistakes, list out the lessons, list out the things that really peed you off. I don't know if I can swear it's four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, really make sure that you're taking account to it. Look around your team and see, are they are they all up for it? How do we get them up for it? How do we motivate them? How do we get there for it? I think whatever your year of, of 2023 was, it's about well, how are you going to make the difference in 2024? How are you going to flip that on its head, use it for motivation, use it for energy, momentum, whatever it might be uh to get there so for me it's about sitting down making sure your idea list is full that your strategy is a solid one that your team is there and it's about looking over to your partners and saying are you ready for that are you going to deliver that for me or do i need to get you out of the way to to deliver this success yeah i think that that's what january is made for isn't it especially in the retail industry let's stop take stock of more than just our stock and you know and work out what the year is going to hold um tim last but definitely not least what are you talking to many merchants at the moment what's your advice to them if you are yeah so my client base is is primarily uh agencies and tech partners but because i came from like the agency world i've got a pretty good and deep network into the brand kind of space so i mean my i've been talking about it I've been talking about it a bit recently and that is my number one advice for anyone but especially brands is just get back to get back to basics like focus on your product and your marketing one could argue they are the same thing right so if you've got really really good product you can probably get away with kind of dog shit marketing for a while but they'll catch up to you right so you got to balance the two and then I think it kind of touches on what Molly's talking about like I'm a big big believer in the opportunity of post post purchase experience now that could be the unboxing experience but it's definitely the customer service that happens after somebody gets their product. The amount of times that I've received a product and the brand is expecting me to have a printer to return it is just crazy. Like, I just don't understand why people aren't thinking about that that kind of end-to-end -end experience. So they're, they're my two pieces of advice. I just want to quickly uh, shout out the, the channel here in terms of the comments to Gethin. A quick sidestep. Yeah, Centro, Commerce Layer, Commerce Tools, Shopline. They're all kind of like headless platforms. Other Tim? Than not Tim, mine, I'm going to yeah. pause you there just because I'm going to bring Gethin's question in later. Uh, okay. So no we, we will go crazy ass deep into that later on. So um, sure. uh, there's there's a big old, for anyone watching the replay, they're like, but what was Gethin's question? You're just going to have to keep watching everybody to find <laughs> out. Um, 
Cool. Thank you for all that, everyone. I think, guess for me so far, theme might be getting back to basics, doing things properly, um, which I would include sustainability and circularity in, just for the sense of clarity. Now, one of the Thanks, reasons Zoe. I wanted to come, my pleasure, Zoe. Uh, Tim, one of the reasons I wanted to come to you last on that one is because our next question, our next statement from me for you guys to discuss is 2024 is going to be just as hard as 2023. And you went early with this one, about yep. six hours early, posting on LinkedIn about it this morning so open us up with your thoughts on this one are we in for another tough year yes yes we are i think it would be unfair for me to suggest that we aren't um and i think you've got to look at it from a micro and macro perspective right so the macro perspective things have gotten better and if inflation is the kind of main driver of consumer sentiment which it kind of is it's come down by like 50 percent, right so is rishi on track i'm not sure but uh the predictions are, and I was listening to uh, some commentary this morning, that it's still going to remain sticky and it's probably going to go up and down. So a, a good example, it's only increased by 0.1%, but it has increased this month compared to last month. So it's kind of going to be hard to tackle. So therefore, I think consumer sentiment and therefore consumer spending is also going to be volatile, but also probably remaining low. The other key thing I think that's happened since the pandemic was, and I, I'm not sure if you guys agree, but there was this pent up demand for like services and getting out of the house, right? So e-commerce increased exponentially because we were all stuck at home and we wanted things. And then that totally dropped off, went back to pre-pandemic levels and everyone went on holiday, and went to the movies and went out to dinner, etc. I suspect that money is gone. Like, you know, everyone went on their Marbella holiday, I'm assuming. So I think that might drop back to 2019 levels. I do think there's some outliers or sort of uh, slight quirks within these th th this statement. And that is, if you're in the luxury space, I think you have the luxury of being in the luxury space. <laughs> you can ride bull and bear markets, right? Like I think rich people are always rich. That's great. And then I think if you're sort of more on the economical side of like a product, maybe in the kind of like budget retail or whatever, you're also, I think, going to be a little bit shielded from volatility because you've priced in that price discount into your margin, right? So you're going to be a, a volume volume game. So anyone who's in the middle, I think might be a bit, uh, that, that might be a bit challenging, right? Kind of always is. And then just generally uh, from what I had been seeing across my client base, and this could be both for brands, but also agencies and kind of tech partners is people were finding it really hard to pull the trigger on sales. And so there's a lot of like, gunking in their pipelines right and i think that will start to get ungunked over this year so slight bit of positivity towards the end there <laughs> see see everyone that's why i needed tim to go first on this one because he wrote the linkedin post about it this morning um i'm happy to carry on discussing this one but does anyone want to disagree with tim or add anything in before we go zoe yeah, i'm gonna add something in just to like um, one of the middle points there because you pointed out about kind of luxury almost kind of being able to ride the storm, whatever, and and, uh, and more economical options, obviously being um, accessible at a time where people's wallets are uh, tight. But I think what I've read quite a lot recently, um, people like Stuart Mackin, m and and uh, Ikea, and very, everyone talking about value. And I think that middle bit is where value is like really important. Well, to everyone, right? And value isn't necessarily being the cheapest. Value is experience, it is accessibility, it's quality, it's convenience. But like, I think you have to know what value means to your customer and you have to build that into everything that you're doing, right? So it doesn't matter what your kind of USP in that space is, but you really have to own it. Um, and that is gonna help you. Uh, be a resilient business the other thing we talk about resi building resilience into your business through circularity as well like supply chain disruption cost of living cost of goods slower margins um there is obviously a huge benefit to bringing secondhand product back into your business whether you want to break it down and use it as spares and repairs or parts in your supply chain that help kind of ameliorate against uh you know all of the challenges that we're seeing externally and have been for a while um, it's not the answer to everything, but it definitely helps you. Yeah, it's, and with a lot of those problems. It's very much that if you're doing that whole buyback secondhand piece within your business, it gives you a different price point and it gives you a lower risk in terms of supply chain. You've got something there. And if you're doing it well with the, you know, with the fast returns piece as well, then you've got stock that's coming back on the shelf. So it's it's interesting how so often we see is the sustainability tactics get built into our businesses, they actually start delivering for us as well. Um, anyone else want to dive in on 2024 being hard or not hard? 
can, can I just jump in as well? <clears throat> I was thinking about this and I was thinking about my own experiences and I was thinking that I'm quite tired of being a bit stingy. Um, the last year, you know, it, I've been like dialing back on my subscriptions, uh, subscription products as well as it probably a bit risky, but I've been dialing back on that. I've not been going to the restaurants. I've not been doing all these great things and I'm quite tired of that. And I think there might be a little kind of, I don't know if it's just me, but a little cohort of customers who are looking for that way to treat themselves. Um, and it kind of feeds into what Zoe was saying as well and the luxury piece. And it, that treat might be more about, it might be a sustainable product. It might be something that is has a really long lifetime. It's something that just becomes ultimately a part of that customer's day to day and a part of that customer's life or an, an irreplaceable part of this little treat themselves moment. Um, so that's just me from like a very one consumer level. But I think there might be for those middle market people you talk about, Tim, that could that could be what they could capitalize on is they're not value uh, and then it's not just a necessity purchase. OK, they might not be luxury, but it's about are you tired of, of not treating yourselves or or they could be buying something that's more uh, integrated into their life or something that they're going to love forever. I think. Yeah. Yeah, that's something that brands could kind of lean on. There was but... an, an example that fits in with that that I saw. Oh, I can ne I'm I'm such a I, I did history at uni and I'm such a terrible historian because I can never remember my references or dates. It's terrible. But um, there was a, an, an example of a brand selling um, fairly high price point male skincare in the form of bars of soap. But it was about so it was hot. It was expensive for a bar of soap, but it was cheap compared to the 20 products you might have on your shelf and it could replace all of them and they were doing it as a okay so you can't afford all 20 anymore but for this one so one bar of incredibly lovely soap that happens to be about five times the price of a bar of soap you can get that bit of luxury within it which i think you know comes back to that mm. thing about you've got to work at how you how you um how you pitch value um I think it's, Jamie, re it's the repositioning, right, Chloe? It's the kind of saying, this this thing has a problem, so here's what we're going to do about it. And I think that, to Tim's point around, brands are brands themselves are kind of waiting too long to sign off in some cases, or at least that's how it feels maybe on the agency side. I think 2024 is going to be just as hard as 2023 if all the major advancements for that brand are still stalled. And it becomes this thing whereby... Um, all the brands I'm speaking to over the last two, three, three months are starting to say, you know why it's stored? It's because we're spending money on a warehouse three times the size we needed because we went really big in COVID and now we're stuck with the bill for five years. So we're going to go rent out, you know, two sections of that to a different brand and share some space and lower that bill and free some more time up. Or these customers aren't coming back as often as they were in 2022. We're going to look at our loyalty program, but we're going to start with small touches and build up to bigger things. And I think... It's the, my view is 2024, putting the economy to the side and everything else. When I focus on the team and the brands, the, the strategy and everything, I think it's going to be just as hard if you're repeating the same mistakes and you're not analyzing the root causes of that. And one big thing that I'm seeing build up is, you know, we've held off on replatform, re-architecture, the loyalty program we know we've needed since 2022. And now we need to get going with it because we just we're seeing the, the long tail suffering because our competitor did it. They put a really great loyalty program back in August, and now we're really deeply jealous of them. So I think it's the it's just, it's going to be as hard if we're still making the same mistakes in our choices and we're still choosing wrong over right. I suppose again, economy aside, we can't do anything about the customers, but let's focus on what we can do in that sense. We can't we can't change the economy. I think um, I, I love that point Jamie because I keep coming back to the fact that yeah 2024 is still going to be fairly shit economically but we've all learned how to play the game so therefore we should be better at it this year however then you go well if everyone's better at it then the competition's going to be harder again so it kind of ends up curling in circles but I want to move us on um not to what you guys are expecting as the next one we're just going to gloss over that we're going to come on <laughs> to this one um because it's my webinar I can do that um we're going to do this one which marketing channel or sales channel is a must do in 2024 and um 
we need to be bringing in uh oh actually sorry all of you watching what i wanted to say was if you've got questions please bring them in um i think gethin has just out paneled all of us the lipstick effect consumers will still tend to buy small luxury items yes you are completely right gethin all of us failed to remember that it had a name so thank you very much for adding that one in we do appreciate it uh, so yeah add any more questions in you've got um so the channel you can't do without in 2024 is Zoe, let's come to you first on this one. Um, I'm going to go a hashtag TikTok name being buy it. Um, I oh. just, um, it's a it's a channel I'm just getting to grips to, but just seeing, uh, you know, my teenage son, he's all of his discovery, his news, everything, his the recipes that he, you know, we're talking about at home. You know, that's the main search engine for everything, both for Gen Z and millennials are, uh, are growing on that platform too and I just don't think you can ignore it and there's so much incentive to use it at the moment the way they're building the pricing model on there at the moment for retailers is just you'd be mad not to be testing it and there's there's every time I, I investigate TikTok there's a new marketing strategy there's now affiliates there's now a marketplace influencers works then there's the whole creator thing then you can do your own stuff it's like it's it's very much an Asian approach to commerce in terms of how um forgotten the name but you know the the big alibaba linked yeah. corporation have just done the whole thing in that one app um so love that that tip that tip Zoe. anyone else on the tiktok train anyone got something else we should be doing in 2024 um tim you're hiding behind you literally you're hiding behind your hand there so i'm guessing i probably <laughs> should come to you um jamie how about you so one you're you're thinking that your your customers really need to be using? Oh, I think TikTok's right there. I think they've, they've just started to hike the prices now. So that low barrier to entry oh. is getting a little bit higher. It's getting more expensive. It's going to be a bit more of a grind. The nice thing is there's a lot of people, uh, influencer or not, sharing those strategies, getting out there and all the rest. There's, there's companies that are maybe overwhelmed with demand when they are just helping with that one channel. But it's, it's certainly easy enough to browse TikTok itself and find those different strategies and, and teach it teach it to yourself. I think there's to to borrow uh, Ed's lovely comment in the the comments right now, it is that influencer side. It's the showing it's the showing and demonstrating and saying this is where it fits in my life. Let me help you visualize the the end goal and so on, which is multi platform, not just TikTok. TikTok's a thing blowing up, but I think that there's a lot of a lot of room for going back to say the Instagram reels and the YouTube shorts and everything and really utilizing the channels that everybody thinks they need to forget about because now TikTok's the popular popular child amongst the family, you know? So don't forget the old ones. Don't forget Twitter and assume that uh assume that LinkedIn's the way. You've got to distribute around those things and, and see what's happening. Yeah, I'm, I might pick up on the the LinkedIn and uh, X, Twitter, whatever. I'm not actually a Twitter user. I saw some interesting data the other day that suggested a couple of things. One, because of Elon's antics, people are moving away from Twitter. And that means yep. the CPAs on LinkedIn are actually getting much higher because Meta and Google are, are, are kind of high. I actually think, though, there's kind of this weird quasi uh, introversion of that that it might get lower on X because everyone's leaving it, right? Now, the yeah. only problem is you've got a bunch of like whack jobs on there. So do you really want to advertise to whack jobs? Maybe if that's the sort of brand you've got. Yeah. But maybe I, I'll just add a couple of things. So go on. Sorry, it's worth the experiment because you're right. Low cost equals a good opportunity, especially if you've not been there before. But it means that less people are playing there. Maybe you could get those conversions, have a look at where where it's at. Yeah. Do and you, I think that do you want to give some... money to Elon though? There's that in there, isn't no, there? No, no way. No way. <laughs> exactly. I keep going. That? I keep having this exact mental thing, Tim. I keep going, well, everyone's leaving Twitter again. Maybe I should do some ads on Twitter. They go, no, I can't bring no. myself to do it, no. which is no judgment on anyone who, who wants to do it. It's worth a test, as Jamie said. But um, but then that, then you're like, why are my morals affecting my marketing? Whole other webinar. Um, sorry, Tim, I, I spoke all over you there. There's there a couple of things there. So one, I do think there's some kind of, I've noticed recently, probably the last 12, 18 months, more brands are on LinkedIn. I don't know if you guys have noticed that, but there's some, you know, sur uh, sur Surreal, Surreal, those guys that do the kind of like cool millennial cereal. Uh, Days Brewing, I think uh, they're actually brothers, Kit and, and Mike. Um, so uh, Batch, London, the suit guys, they seem to be doing a lot of LinkedIn stuff. And I think there's a convergence, right? Personal branding is obviously a big thing. So all these founders are on LinkedIn. And then it's kind of like this 
sort of mix of their brand is there and then the founder is there. So I think that channel is kind of an interesting one. I would argue that maybe organic channels are probably something that you need to be focusing on in 2024, not yeah. least because things are getting expensive and third party data like landscape is changing. So I reckon things like CRM newsletters, I think are underrated. I think newsletters are really, really powerful. I think community building, SMS and WhatsApp, I think is kind of interesting. I was at a talk uh, a few months ago and we were discussing the kind of pros and cons of SMS and WhatsApp, right? And the sort of the download was SMS, uh, certainly for me and kind of the group agreed, it's very formal. It's like I get a notification of my shipping and like it's kind of this weird sort of slightly faceless transactional kind of like com communication. Whereas WhatsApp's very intimate. Like that's where you have your family chats. And I think brands got to be a little bit careful about getting into the WhatsApp world. Then the other thing is WhatsApp's obviously massive here and in Europe and it's not in America. So depending on which side of the pond that you're on. Mm -hmm. One thing I do want to call out, we touched on it before, and that is loyalty. It's more of a tactic than a channel. So I know the guys, all the loyalty guys. I know Charlie at Loyalty Line, great product. I really love what they do. I'm not so bullish on loyalty. I do find that it often gets engineered and it becomes artificial, right? The reality is consumers are not really that loyal. They are fickle right? Uh, and I think we try and introduce these loyalty programs, even though that that's a thing. So they work really well, right? For high frequency purchases, like repeat purchases, right? Like who's got a coffee card loyalty? I've got the Gales like, app. I don't live near Gales because I'm not uh, wealthy enough to live in a lovely area. But if I did, <laughs> I would use it all the time because Gales is right there. But if I leave, I'm not going to use it. So I'm not loyal anymore, am I? I'm loyal because it's there because it's it's frequent. Uh, it's, it's, it's a function of proximity and frequency, right? So that's not to say that the loyalty programs don't exist. I think you just got to be really, really careful with it and really, really think about it. And the type of brand that they are, I think, sort of impacts the kind of the, whether a loyalty is going to win. But I, I'd go back to the start of the conversation. Focus on the product. Product always wins. I think that, yeah. that loyalty point is so, so important. It, it's like I see it's a bit like people used to do with affiliates and still unfortunately do. It's like I installed it. It's all going to be brilliant. And loyalty is a bit like we installed the app. Everything's going to be brilliant. It's like, yeah, but what's your strategy? What? Why are you doing this? What? Who are you trying to target? How does this fit into your overall piece? And I think, I think the concept of loyalty and understanding that and getting to grips with how it relates to your customer relationships makes total sense. But whether that's sending a couple of emails, putting something better in the parcels, uh, doing a you know a circular uh, buyback process, it might not be a loyalty piece. But Jamie, you you touched on loyalty earlier. So did you want to add anything in on that? Yeah, I think it's it's the. I'll dig out the report, or so I'm not multitasking. Now, but it was a consumer report that said pe that consumers are sticking to the brands they're familiar with more often than than trying new ones. And some of that is about consumers that were typically used to going into retail stores, seeing it, and buying it, and online they're just kind of they don't want to make that extra leap, right? So they're going back to people they know they're going to have a good time with. They know they're going to. Uh, maybe see some consistency with and all the rest of, you know, maybe that's over to Molly's point around if the shipping gets messed up one time, it breaks that cycle a little bit, right? So it's maybe not traditional uh, loyalty, but it is about that familiarity of saying, are we consistent? Is the experience all the way there? Mm -hmm. If we see the CEO on LinkedIn, are they, you know, go over to someone like Brewdog dropping the, dropping the salaries of everybody right now when we thought they were actually a brand that looked after employees. Does that devalue what I'm experiencing elsewhere of, of that brand? So I think the, it, it's not the loyalty in the traditional sense in terms of those programs, but it is, it is also when you think about it, uh, Tim rightfully says, it's, it's about that strategy. It's about well, what time do you actually surprise them in that process? What time do you include something they weren't expecting or, bring them into something that is uniquely theirs rather than say one day access to a sale everybody else gets. It's where are you really paying attention to those little things and bringing them along the journey or even involving them in your future products, your future development, your future uh, brands, again, rather than just trying to sell them stuff over and over again and that being the only, only objective. We, um... It's like you. Oh, sorry. I'll, I'm. I'm going to say something. Bring us to Molly, and then we'll come to you, Zoe. I'm <laughs> okay. um, just very aware that the clock's ticking down, and we've got so much more to cover. But I think it, it's so interesting listening to what you're saying there, Jamie. That it's like that old question of how do we get more repeat customers? Well, recruit the right customers in the first place. How do we get more loyal customers? Treat them well during the buying process, which is entirely what 
you know, Molly and the team at Penny Black do. So I was going to pivot that really seamlessly, but now I'm telling you what I'm doing. It's clearly, <laughs> clearly the COVID is both making Love me it. scroll on the wrong screens, but also revealing what's going on in my head. Um, Molly, that's what yeah. are you seeing people coming to you from the loyalty pr perspective, yeah. not just with the I need more sales perspective. Yeah. Yeah. So going back to the loyalty program piece, the customer loyalty piece, just to, to re fill that. I think if brands are looking to invest in those loyalty retention channels, they need to be able to prove the value, right? They need to be able to prove return on investment, the additional revenue, everything that has been generated by that loyalty piece. And it's it depends how you track it, right? Like if it's a loyalty program, you might track how many email subscribers you get and then attribute every purchase of that email subscriber, whatever, however you attribute it. Um, but I think that's like the first thing that brands really need to be very aware of when they're looking at like the loyalty program piece that you're talking about, Tim, is like, can they prove the value and the return on that investment? But back to your po point, Chloe, is like taking it back to, to Penny Black, it's saying, well, take a really personalized and measure approach to building that loyalty and actually really engage customers with stuff they want to see at the time they're unboxing their order, which is the only time in the real world they're really experiencing your product so why are you not using that moment to build their loyalty with something super personalized something that they're going to love to see and use so i don't know tailored content i love using our example of, of a tea brand we work with called bird and blend and when they send their customers their matcha tea they have an insert of a recipe of how to use that matcha tea in a fancy latte that is something that customer will want and, and love to receive um, and it's the right time to surprise them and it's that physical thing and I think that's going to come back as well as the physical experience too so real are doing all the billboards and things like that like taking that digital loyalty into the real world as well and Zoe I cut you off there what were you, what did you want to add in well I think the two points is that it actually comes back to value again right so people are potentially loyal to product but not necessarily to where they buy them from right so you might like uh, brand x's product but if you can get free shipping on someone else's website you're probably going to buy it from there rather than the website that charges you four pound for it um and similarly with the the unboxing experience that's value that's experience that creates that you know positive um relationship with the brand that is is what your customer is looking for and that is then you know kind of what helps build the business moving forward but we had a great, uh, it was an unofficial loyalty program at Topshop. We just took some of our most engaged customers. We gave them free shipping. That was it. But we used them and we talked to them about product launches and what they wanted to see and would they pay X for X and stuff. And the feedback and the data and the insight that we got was invaluable and they felt part of the brand. And, and that, I guess, is a, a big opportunity as well. Get your customers involved. Talk to them. Like, make sure that you know what it is that they're looking for and, and what they want from you. And I think one, like, sorry, sorry. Go. I was just going to say one anecdote of the Bird and Blend brand. We were speaking to them at an event, and we we're saying that look, you have this amazing community. It's like inspirational for for other brands. We recommend community growth all the time, and, and their community is amazing. And the uh, one of the eco managers was like, "Yeah, they're great. They will go on the website, notice a typo, tell us, or tell us like a button's broken before anyone else. And they they message us and say, "Hey, like I just want to tell you that I don't know that this link's broken. That is like raw community, and they really are bought in, and they believe like." as a customer they want to make that brand's experience the best and they feel really part of that and they want that website to perform well right just wanted to yeah. bring that anecdote in uh, sorry yeah. jamie over to you no i was, I was about to provide a couple i think it's it Chloe mentioned b2b earlier and i think it's a good example of what zoe's saying where if you go to those top customers and start saying what do you need to see what's the things you're annoyed with etc and you start developing those that's the same it's influencing the roadmap you're probably going to develop anyway but you're able to go back to those customers and say, here's something we've done because of you. You go to customer support and say, okay, well, they're complaining about the shipping price as being a bit wrong. You fix that. You go back to those customers and say, we did this because of you. It's easy to breed those things without it being extremely expensive and, and time consuming and the rest. It's just about making it part of your DNA and your connection to those customers. Okay. So I want to take us to our question from the audience. Guys, usually we get bombarded with questions. I guess we're doing an awesome job. But if you've got questions, get them in very, very quickly because we're about to run out of time to ask them. Um, you guys have already done, the panelists have already done quite a good job of answering this one in the, uh, the, the comments already. So the comments are in there. 
What other e-commerce platforms, Gethin Heyman is asking, apart from the usual, Magento, Shopify, Big Commerce, et cetera, that we should be keeping an eye on? Um, we, I, I think, Tim, you've already answered in the in the thing. I'll come to to Jamie first as our resident Magentoite. What would or Adobeite these is? I'm never quite sure which I'm supposed to say. Um, what's your? What, who else would you be putting on a on a list? I think. Tim's would you dare? <laughs> oh, I, my my uh, my biased answer is nobody, but I think that the the honest answer is that that uh, a lot of platforms are sticking uh, are propping up around. Uh, specific needs, specific deployment, specific, you know, this is the problem we have with these typical platforms. So we're going to really nail this particular aspect of it. And, you know, not to be cheesy about it, but there's there's so many great e-commerce platforms out there doing that great job rather than all doing the same thing they used to used to do. So I think Tim's Tim's uh, outline answer here is a good one. I think my, my caveat is always to be saying, are they profitable? When are they being profitable? How are they getting there? And so on. Because a lot of these have got big money around them and are nowhere yep. near profit. And that's a yep. big risk to bet mm -hmm. five years out of the rest. It's not to say you shouldn't, but it's more to say a lot of them are turning to 2024 saying, this is the year we're going to be profitable after two, three, four years of not being profitable. It, it feels... Clear. It feels from my perspective like we're very much in the era of you've got to go back to doing really in-depth tenders, really in-depth sourcing process if you want to switch website platform at the moment. It's not a it, – it, they're, they're offering such – once you get under the skin, everyone's offering so many – such different approaches and different ways of working and as you said Jamie different financial backing and levels of risk and security you've really got to do your homework at the moment you can't just go everyone else is going there or or that guy seemed seemed really approachable I enjoyed chatting with him we'll go with them yeah and increasingly uh, previous years agencies are kind of just forcing you down the road that they offer right rather than saying actually this is a good fit for x let me go refer you over to this great agency that does x instead and I think that uh, platforms are getting better at saying, this is what we're specifically good at. If you want X, Y, and Z, actually, it's over here instead. And I think that uh, listing, say, Adobe and Shopify in particular, they're really, really good at saying, this is not necessarily the limit, but the best fit before you look over in, in this direction, et cetera. And it's, it's, nice. it's nice to have, because maybe three, four years ago, everybody was claiming they could do everything. Every All you had was retail and getting in absolute car crashes repeatedly and it's the it's the headless problem isn't it like if if every agency says they could do headless but only 10 percent can if the 90 percent have bad experiences and the 10 percent suffer in that sense you know, it's it's uh yeah platforms is yeah. an interesting place right now it is i'm gonna gonna take us on for platforms before we go completely down the platforms um rabbit hole because there's a subject that's very close to my heart that we haven't really touched on today which is sustainability and i think we've so i'd love to know all of yours take on this both in terms of what you want to happen and what you're seeing happen because i feel like um consumers are moving faster towards wanting sustainability than we thought we would i think we as an industry are moving closer and, and sustainability is becoming easier to achieve. And I mean it in the whole remit from putting um, uh, uh, sun onto something, create electricity, solar panels, <laughs> we go again, putting solar panels on the roof of your warehouse through to using recycled boxes and packaging through to buyback schemes um, like Zoe and the team at Turn Eco do it's becoming so much easier to do it. The business models are becoming much stronger. It feels like consumers are starting to, to be after this, but we're also now as an industry in a better position to start pushing it forwards and start making tougher decisions based on what sustainability brings to us. Um, Zoe, I'll come to you first on this one, partly because no one else knew I was going to ask anything about this. Um, and because I'm assuming you're going to give me quite a good answer. <laughs> Um, I did, I'm sure I can. I just I, there's a lot to unpick in there, so I'm just trying to think about well, how to be fixing. Let me let me give you an actual question then. Am I still more wishing we'd become more sustainable as an industry, or is it actually happening? Um, I think it is actually happening. Um, I think what we're seeing is from a consumer perspective, I think there's still a say do gap. They say they want to buy uh, more ethically, more sustainably. Mm. Um, but physically actually doing it and spending power is not quite there yet. 
um, I think um, cost is still a driving factor. Um, but from a business perspective, we are definitely seeing more people having uh, these conversations, more retailers across different sectors of retail. Um, you know, we've got clients now in, in four markets, but from furniture to cameras to children's shoes to glasses, I mean, everyone is starting to talk about this. And what I think is really interesting is that actually some of the retailers that have started dipping their toe in the water, especially within circular retail models, but outsourced them to start with because they weren't quite sure how to do it and it seemed a bit hard and they weren't, you know, they weren't ready to really pull the trigger, are now looking like, no, this is a big opportunity for us. You know, we want to bring this in-house. How do we own it? Um, and I think that's really exciting because, you know, to be truly sustainable and circular you have to own it from start to finish and you know I've, I've talked before about how it's not just about the product it's about the initial design and the materials you use in designing for end of life from the outset it's about your physical retail stores if you have them and every marketing um piece of collateral that you create for them and and all of your store fitting and fixtures and everything in your offices it's, it's it can be overwhelming but i think we're seeing um seeing it comes to the fore of a lot of businesses. Well, and it's so much easier now than it was just 12 months ago in terms of the apps that are available, the been there, done that. And most most companies are totally willing to share how they do it as well. It's not like you're inventing the wheel, which we all seem to be doing. Um, Tim, you've been putting some fascinating faces. So um, what's, what's your take? Are you seeing the agencies and everything that you work with getting demand to be more sustainable, to be on... Uh, better cloud platforms, those kind of things from their, from their brand? No, I, I'm going to take a contrarian view and I'm going to sort of uh, sort of suggest that consumers are not becoming more sustainable. I mean, Shein is going for a $90 billion valuation, right? Shein is a not a sustainable brand in any way, shape or form. But, but I think that's the they do gap, right? So customers... Exactly, ex exactly. So I think the gap is bigger. So I think that the, the you know, as a consumer, right, I will happily change my straw from a plastic one to a cardboard one, right? Easy, easy for me to do. As a consumer, will I not fly on a plane? Probably not, right? Like that's a really hard choice to make. So I think it, it, maybe we give consumers a hard time. I mean, governments can't even agree net zero targets or stick to them. So if the country <laughs> and the planet can't agree to these things, how can we kind of expect consumers to do it? Um, so, yeah, look, I would like to think, and I, I totally agree with you. I think there's loads of initiatives. And Zoe, what you're doing is fucking amazing. Like, I just think there's so much cool stuff out there. I would just argue that consumers, especially now, and we've got to think about, like, the type of consumer, right? So an affluent consumer, sure, they can afford to be sustainable. Like, you know consumers at different demographics i don't know if they they can be and especially on i'm gonna pull crisis, you right? up on that tim i know zoe took, took a massive breath in i i spent a large portion of this morning looking at shoes on vinted and i can get some glorious shoes on vinted for four quid that are just that have been tw worn twice probably to a wedding or something i'm looking for new shoes to wear on stages this year right when i'm doing keynotes and stuff so these are really you know, high level, look like they've just come out of the box shoes. They're four quid, five quid, a couple of them are 20 quid, but they'd be retailing at 80. So I'm not sure, you know, yes, yeah, some of the, the switches that get made in the sustainability space are income dependent, but a lot of the, the lower level income, there is, there's plenty of ways that they can be. So I think we, we have to be careful when we're making those demographic I so would say that there are ways, but I don't know what the stat. I mean, I, I, I suppose no, I'm no, I've no Sheehan, idea what the stats are. The Shein valuation to me is a good example, right? Like that's a pretty big subset of consumers, right? Both affluent, middle, and maybe lower, right? And that thing is just going bananas. So mm -hmm. that suggests to me that consumers aren't as worried about sustainability. Now, if they were going bust, I'd be thinking, yeah, maybe. Is it fair to say that it's about certain verticals, though? So, like, I look at furniture, and I, you know, I just recently purchased from. Uh, Barker and Stonehouse, and they have Clara B as a partner where they will remove your previous furniture for you. And, you know, if you're differencing between two or three, you'll go, well, actually, that's pretty good because that would have stayed in my back garden and not been recyclable at all. Yeah. But furniture may be really easy to provide that as an option, even with a third party partner. So, to you, do you yeah. see like different sectors really thriving at this and then other sectors lagging behind? Is there a I pattern of the muscle? I think there are certain sectors where it seems more obvious electronics furniture mm. etc 
I think the interesting thing about the Sheen example, if we want to go down that road, um, and is that I think there is also a massive consumer mindset, right? We've all been taught you need new staff, you want more staff, mm -hmm. you need a new mm -hmm. outfit for this, you need like, and that is something that retailers have done and marketing teams have done and built. And there is is a level of re-education that actually you don't necessarily need it. But sometimes you do, right? You need a new T-shirt, you need a new pair of shoes, you need a new sofa, whatever it is. Like, we, uh, being, buying something new to you isn't necessarily bad, right? But the planet is running out of resources. We can't continue to create as much new stuff. And I think the, the whilst the rise of resale, which is you know still the fastest sector of retail currently at the moment, fastest growing, um, secondhand often feels not like a not a pleasant experience and that mm. i think is a challenge yeah. that as retailers we also have to overcome right because if i can buy something secondhand at a price point that gives me access to a brand that i couldn't have bought that from before um and i feel good about that because i know where it's coming from and i feel that the quality has been checked and you know i, I get to um have all the same customer experience great amazing but if i go on to a a secondhand website and everything's all a bit crumpled up and mm -hmm. I'm buying it from someone else and I don't know whether they've washed it or whatever. That isn't, <laughs> that's a problem, right? Totally, and, totally. and so that's a barrier. And so I think there's a couple of things that as an industry, we still need to overcome in order to drive um, more change and, and changing consumer behavior, but it's absolutely possible. No, okay. no question, I'm fussing. <laughs> I'll ask a question, Chloe. Chloe can probably know, maybe. Okay. So um, I was just going to say, we are. So, I would happily talk about this all afternoon into the evening, but we're going to have to to move into the end game in a moment. But Jamie, if you're quick, I will let you ask your quick question. No, I was just, I was, I was thinking, Zoe, in terms of, is there like a a point that people regularly start at versus the people that maybe end up at it, this thing, right? So we see people think. I don't know, labels like B Corp get chucked around and maybe that's the gold standard at the end. But at the start, it's just making sure that, say, your product gets recycled or collected if you are replacing something that's going to ultimately not get recycled. What's the kind of... I'm fascinated because you're clearly very knowledgeable about it in terms of what's the gold standard versus where do you just get started? Because those people get blocked on step one because step three seems so far away. I would say the first point to getting started is start run and take back program, right? Mm -hmm. You don't need to offer a huge amount of credit to your customers to drive the behavior because there's, there's the two, there's two folds uh, kind of motivation in it. One is the credit you're getting, but one is the knowledge that you are, um, you know, you don't have to take, chuck that thing in the bin that someone is dealing with it responsibly. It's a problem that you had. You didn't know what to do with it. It was going to sit in your wardrobe, sit in a shed, sit in the loft. Do the, run the take back scheme because as a retailer, there's a huge amount that you can learn just from bringing that product back into your system. You don't necessarily need to have all of the answers to start with, but what you'll learn about customer life cycle, product wear and tear, all of that can will be invaluable in helping you build your business moving forward. That would be my starting point. Like it. Thank you so massively on brand there as well. So uh, appreciating that one. Um, okay, like I said, we are gonna have to go into the end, kind of like coming into land now. Um, I know we've had a, a quite in-depth question from Mubashir. Afraid we're not gonna get to that one because uh, I think that's possibly a whole webinar all on its own. If if panelists have any thoughts on that, feel free to type them away as we do the, the last few minutes. Um, the question I want to pose to each of you is we have covered so much stuff in this and there's so much we haven't covered either so for each of you can you give me a one minute answer okay i'm not putting the clock on but i will jump in if you seem to be going on forever a one minute answer on what is your key takeaway from this if the audience are only taking one thing away you can start something new if you want but we're not going to follow up on it um what's your one takeaway molly uh, we haven't heard from you in a while so we'll come to you first yeah. please <laughs> I think it's going back to what I said at the beginning, making the most from what you're already doing and what you already have, making that work, be simple, sim simplify and use the data you have at your disposal to make that stuff you're already doing amazing. Obviously, I'm going to talk about the unboxing moment. You're already packaging your products. You already might have a thank you note going in there. That's something you can really optimize, drive value from, drive repeat purchase and actually be able to measure revenue increase. I think that's where brands need to focus this year. 
Brilliant. Thank you, Molly. Uh, we'll carry on clockwise. So, Jamie, next, please. Cool. Uh, for me, I think a common theme that we've repeat, we've we've all repeated is kind of how do you take something really big that seems quite scary and just narrow it down to the first step? How do you just get started with that thing? And when it comes to learning from the mistakes, looking at twenty twenty three or or further behind it, asking yourself things like: Do we need to focus on revenue or do we need to focus on profit? Do we need to focus on getting to this end stage or do we just need to focus on getting started? And a lot of it is about getting off the start line, moving forward to that that end destination, even if that end destination never gets reached, and just making those really big problems smaller because they're just they're just going to be more achievable. You're going to get much more morale around the team around achieving those things quickly than waiting six, nine, 12 months for that end goal. I think that's a theme we've, we've all repeated today. Um, we just had a marvellous comment coming from Gethin. Can we have a part two talk? <laughs> Love that you put the, the smart, the laughing emoji on the end of that one, Gethin. Um, possibly not, but I'm gonna um offer up all of our um all of our panelists to say they are all brilliant at getting back to people on LinkedIn. So if you've got questions, specific questions, or anything you want to talk about, do get in contact with them. All their details are below this video somewhere. So please do do that. Um, Tim, your quick one minute. What do we take away from this? What's the most important thing we need to be doing in 2024, please? I mean, it's the, it's the same thing that's been that's been sort of echoed, right? It's like, I, I think, just get back to basics and don't focus on the shiny things. I would potentially put AI in that bucket. Like, we didn't talk about it, which is probably a good thing. It sucked up a lot of oxygen. I think explore it, but just don't let it distract you. I think just get back to basics. Focus on your product and your marketing. Focus on whatever business model you got. If you're an agency, you're a brand, you're a tech partner, on what, what Jamie just said, profitability profitability and to be honest like this shouldn't be anything new right this should be a plan every year i don't know this shouldn't be like a like this isn't some revelation in 2024 like make a profitable business my final and most important advice is hire one of these people in the room chloe zoe or work with molly and jamie that's my big advice go and work with one of these guys or tim we should put that as well um <laughs> well, that goes without saying of course but yeah, I, I know what you mean about the profit factor. It's like I'm prepping a, a presentation similar to this for, for IRX um, in a couple of weeks time. And it's like, number one tip for 2024, make a profit, have a profit target, actually think about profit. It shouldn't shouldn't need to be said, but somehow it feels like it should be. Um, Zoe, you're our, our final panelist to talk. What's your one um, key thing for 2024? Um, well, I would always echo back to basics, get your basics right. I mean, too many people go after the shiny, shiny and and neglect the, the basics and, and they suffer for it. But I don't think it's going to be a surprise to say that um, I think 2024 is the year that we're going to see circular retail go mainstream. So my top tip is if you uh, make sure that you know what your sustainability strategy is and make it core to everything you do, because if you're not thinking about it already, you really should be. I totally agree with you. And I really, really, really hope that one comes true as Molly's lights go off again as we're talking sustainability. <laughs> Look, thank you to all four of you for being here. Really appreciate your thoughts. I'm going to drop you off in the green room now and I might come and I'll come and talk to you all later. But if you want to go, you can go. Uh, a couple of things to let the lovely audience know about. Um, if you want more top tips for e-commerce success in 2024, our podcast episode about that very subject goes live on Monday on the e-commerce master plan podcast. Podcast. I've got seven more e-commerce experts joining me to share their one tip on that show. It is already recorded, so I can tell you the advice is brilliant. I can also tell you that we've been doing this since 2016, and every single year it is our most listened to episode. So don't miss out. Tune into that on Monday, e-commerce master plan podcast, top tip for e-commerce success in 2024. And um Hey, cheers, Pep. Cheers, Deb. Even thank you for coming along and joining us too. Um, we have also, the one last thing I need to do is, Gethin, whilst we're not doing a part two talk on this topic, we will be doing another one of these webinars um, next month. And our topic for that webinar is going to be sustainability. And how can the e-commerce tech stack help make your business more sustainable? We will be getting into both how you make your tech stack more sustainable. So we'll be talking a bit about that, website speed, server choices, all that beautiful, exciting stuff. Um, and we will also be talking about the types of tech that are now available to help you be more sustainable, like Turn Eco that Zoe runs that we were listening to earlier. Um, 
glamorous. I'm so not glamorous, Molly, especially not today. Uh, but yeah, so we'll be doing that next week. You will, sorry, not next week, next month. You will get the link to sign up for that in the email you get um, later on today to let you know about the replay. So if you want, we did cover a lot today. If you want to rewatch the replay, share the replay with key members of your team, please do do that because we do have, um, we will be, the replay will be available very soon, probably within the next hour. And thank you all for joining us live. And thank you all who come along and watch the replay too. It's been an absolute pleasure hanging out with you this afternoon or morning or wherever you might be in the world and um, have a brilliant, brilliant uh, rest of the day. Bye everybody. <laughs>